We have been preaching through a series from Mark Moore's book called Core 52. We have copies on the table. If you'd like one, they're free, our gift to you. The Core 52 scriptures, he says that if you understand these, then you have a good understanding of what the Bible is all about and what Christianity is all about. We're almost to the end. We're up to number 44, the resurrection. It struck me as appropriate. The songs that we sang this morning were all in tune with that. I don't know if that was intentional or, or just the spirit, but it was, uh, it was really pretty cool. This message is very personal for me. August the 13th, 1985, one of the finest people I've ever met in my life, my stepmother. She came into my life when I was 12. And after I became a follower of Jesus, she and my dad began attending the church where I was baptized at. I had been raised Episcopalian. And they wanted to see what's this new cult that has changed Jimmy. And she was uh, an LPN, loved church, loved learning about the Bible, was growing as a follower of Jesus. And on August the 13th, she was, uh, had worked all day and then gone to church for a Sunday school planning meeting because the fall season was coming up. And on the way home, she was killed instantly by a drunk driver on the river road in Point Pleasant, Pennsylvania. My first real encounter with death, my Grandfather had died when I was a teenager, but this one really hit close to home. We had a memorial service for Margie at the Bucksmont Christian Church in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. The place was packed. The music was great. I got to read from her Bible. A relatively young Christian. She had a Thompson study Thompson Chain Study Bible, which was really big back in the early 80s. And it just connected all the scriptures together if you really wanted to know what the Bible was about. You can actually read the Bible. And her notes, her highlights were all over it. And I didn't realize at the time I was supposed to just read one or two passages. And I must have read 20 and her notes. And I, I think I think Chuck was a little bit irritated at me, but I was so excited to see what had meant so much to her. And it was sad, it was tragic, all the emotion that goes through something like that. And yet at the same time, it was a celebration because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we knew that she had a strong faith and she had the hope of heaven. So it's, you've, you've been there. You, you've, you've, someone you've lost who's a follower of Jesus and you miss them, it's, you're the lump in the throat, the tears that come unexpectedly at the worst possible moment. And then the, the uh, overwhelming sense of joy. So we're out in the foyer and this one guy comes out and he had been a lifelong friend of both my dad, they had gone to high school together, and my stepmom, he had actually introduced the two of them and uh, put them together and they eventually got married. He was not a Christian at all. I don't know that he believed anything he was, with no exaggeration, one of the most carnal men I've ever met in my life. I heard language coming from his mouth that I, I didn't know existed. Um, but he and my dad were best friends, and, and he loved Margie. And he came out, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he was drunk. He was also a, a pretty good drunk. And he stopped, and he looked around at all these people who were laughing and smiling and crying, but laughing and crying. And he says, why the blank is everyone so blankety blank happy? What we believe makes a difference. And for someone who hasn't got that faith, they don't know what to do with it. And it was never so obvious as that moment. <laughs> Why is everyone so blankety blank happy in the face of such an overwhelming tragedy? What you believe, and I'm going to assume most of us are here because we're followers of Jesus, so we have that core faith that Tim read about, and that, that Kim spoke about. 
but perhaps you still have doubts and perhaps you still have questions and I know we have an audience and there are people that watch that don't believe at all. I have, I have friends who are former believers. I have friends who have lost loved ones in similar circumstances. I have one good friend who watched his, his saintly mother who was a follower of Jesus slowly die of dementia and it caused him to lose his faith to the point now where he is convinced that there is no God and I'm basically an intellectual idiot for claiming that there is. Why don't I just smarten up? And why don't the rest of us just get on with the real world instead of all this pretend, superstitious, religious malarkey? My answer to that is, his perspective is as much about faith as mine, is it not? Wherever you're going to land, it's going to require faith because there's nothing concrete out there to say 100% this is it or that's it. What we have is evidence and we weigh the evidence and even in the face of overwhelming tragedy, it was actually a good thing for me because I was able to, to deeply question my faith and say, yeah, it works. It's, it, it held up, it does hold up. You can stare death in the face and have joy and have hope and have confidence. And, and that perspective, what you believe, whether it's Christian or something else or nothing, what you believe affects how you live your life now, your value system. Kim was talking about intercommunion meditation. All that she is is derived from what she believes. And I thought, I, I was so proud of her. She won't puff herself up, but I'll say, I mean, to be in the, in the company of your professional peers and boldly state, it's my faith that makes me who I am or what I am. Because she screws up, guess what? Who looks bad? God, Jesus. And she's willing, the, the compliment, which she won't tell you, was what her boss said to everyone else in the room, and she really lives it. I think that's... What you believe is going to affect how you live and, and how you die. And guess what? <laughs> there's, a, there's a date out there for all of us. Look at a tombstone. What are the two dates? Birth, death. What's in the middle? A little dash. We're all on the dash. N.T. Wright wrote a book. He's a, he's a theologian, a scholar, an author. Uh, his book was called Surprised by Hope. He's written dozens of others, of others. He says, it's a lie to say all religions are basically the same. And, and that, that's kind of what the modern conception is. The lump religion all into one. And that's just ignorant. I mean, if you've studied comparative religions, to say that we are all the same is just ridiculous. For instance, Islam. If a Palestinian boy is killed by an Israeli soldier, guess what? He goes straight to heaven. Boom! Martyrdom for Allah. Or if, if you happen to be of Hindu persuasion, or even some Buddhists believe this, karma is going to determine reincarnation. And so in your next life, you're, you're going to pursue the next stage of your journey. I had a fascinating conversation. I've told you about this so many times with a young man in Burma. And I just asked him, I said, so what do you remember of your past life? He was Buddhist. He's giving me a tour around the Shwedagon Pagoda. What do you remember? What lessons are you applying to your current life? None. Really? Didn't make sense to me. How am I supposed to learn? If you're an Orthodox Jew, you believe that at the end of the world, all the righteous are going to be raised to a new individual body life. If you're a Buddhist, depending on the school of Buddhism, and again, there's sub 
categories for all these religions, even, in, even Christianity, but a lot of the world believes that you just disappear like a drop in the ocean. You lose your own individual identity and you just go into some formless, nameless beyond. You just, just join the goo. There's differences as to what the dead are up to now, and we all wonder about that. In Africa and, and Haiti for sure, and other parts of the world, even Japan, ancestor worship. You appease your ancestors so they'll help you, or you pay them off so they won't mess your life up and do mischief on you. This is, this is what they believe the dead are up to. Even traditional Christian beliefs like judgment, heaven, hell, resurrection that we don't like to talk about a lot are offensive to modern sensibilities. There's lots of ideas out there. You see these at funerals. I go to a lot of funerals. I don't even necessarily do them a lot, but I, I actually love to go to funerals. Funerals are one of the favorite things I like to do. I, I'll do a funeral over a wedding any day because they stay dead. But I love going to funerals. I, I love watching how other guys treat them and, and what they do and how they offer hope from the scripture and, and things like that. But there's lots of ideas out there. Some people believe that the soul doesn't go on. It's, it's just completely annihilated. You just poof, you cease, cease to exist. It's like a match. Strike it, light it, boom, that's it. You're gone. No past, no future. It's just a little wisp of smoke. Dylan Thomas wrote this poem, Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Very popular poem, but what's it saying? Rage, rage. Why? Because that's all there is. Fight it. And that's why a lot of people are scared to death of death. Reincarnation we've talked about. Absorption into the wider world. Here's a popular poem that you're also going to hear at a lot of funerals. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Sounds beautiful, very sentimental, kind of gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling like, like, a, like a chocolate chip cookie right out of the oven. Makes me want to throw up. <laughs> you did die, and you are dead, and you are not a rain shower or a snowstorm. But we don't like to consider any other alternative, and so we go to that which just makes us feel good. And sometimes the truth, if we're not willing to yield to it, is very uncomfortable. And of course, let's talk about ghosts, let's talk about spiritualists, let's talk about mediums, let's talk about talking to the dead. They are out there and they are advising us. And right here in a story are several places you can go and, and, and there are people who will put you in contact with a long departed or a near departed loved one. Demons are also pretty smart and I think they exist, but this is what people believe. Most people have no idea what resurrection means or why Christians believe it. Even a lot of Christians hold really unbiblical ideas and what happens when you die. I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, she's up there watching over us now. No, she's not. She's up there if she's a follower of Jesus, worshiping God. And if she's not a follower of Jesus, she ain't paying attention to you. They're a guardian angel. Again, the sentimentalizing or if you're a good Catholic, if you're really good, when you die, one of these days, you can become a saint. You've got so much goodness that has added up. Your salvation really isn't based on what Jesus did. It's based on how good you are, and you can be so good, you've got excess. You've got a prophet of righteousness, and so the church decides that they can saint you and then take some of that goodness and spread it around to other people. Isn't that cool? It's also completely unbiblical. There's this idea of purgatory. 
Again, a Catholic teaching primarily, an intermediate place where, where you don't get to go to heaven because God's got to refine you, so you've got to spend a couple extra eons. Actually, I think I read recently where the scholars have concluded that it's about a thousand years. How in the world they figure that out is beyond me. But you spend time in purgatory paying off your spiritual debt, expiating for your sins, and then when you're refined to the point that you're acceptable to go to heaven, God takes you out of purgatory and plops you into heaven. There's the idea of universalism. Everyone is saved. Rob Bell popularized this uh, some time ago with his book called Love Wins, in which he went from being an orthodox follower of Jesus to he's now widely considered heretical because of his denial of hell or judgment. A lot of us think that heaven's just going to be boring. What, how, what, what do I want to think about heaven? Some float around in a cloud all day with a bunch of angels and strumming a harp. I don't even like harps. And I've heard this one. God is just too self-absorbed. He just wants to be worshipped all the time. Why would I want to follow a God that, that is, you know, where I'm not allowed to be self-absorbed. Why, is, why does God get to be self-absorbed? Well, why is God jealous? I'm not allowed to be jealous. Well, because God is perfect and worthy of all of that stuff. But I've actually had people tell me that. In the ancient world, the pagans believed that the underworld was a one-way street. Death was all-powerful. There was no answer for it. They left open the possibility of a glorious but disembodied future. Example, the emperor could become a god, but they never expected the emperor to come back. I mean, they built the pyramids in Egypt so that the, the, the kings could have food on their journey, but they never expected the king to actually show up again. The Jews really didn't believe in a, in a resurrection at all, or, or at best they believed in an eventual resurrection at the judgment day. You know, in the New Testament, the Sadducees, they were religious mucky yuck scholars. They didn't believe in a resurrection. The Pharisees did. Martha to Jesus in John chapter 11 when Jesus asked if you believe he's going to rise again, what did she say? She said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That was a typical Jewish belief, but it was everybody. It was corporate. It wasn't an individual type of thing, but into this world, which really wasn't anticipating a resurrection, comes the gospel. A miracle-working, self-proclaimed prophet named Jesus gathers a ragtag following of nobodies, royally ticks off the governing religious elite with his heretical teaching, got himself crucified on a Roman cross. He had repeatedly promised that he was going to return to life after three days, but nobody, not even his closest followers, believed him. And when he died, what did they do? They didn't have a prayer vigil outside of his grave waiting for the resurrection. They ran and they hid because they were scared to death and they thought, they're coming for us next. Resurrection was the furthest thing from their mind. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they stop running and they start preaching that Jesus is alive again. And even when they were threatened and killed to shut them up, they kept preaching that Jesus was alive. How did that happen? How do they go from not believing it at all to being willing to lay down their lives teaching and preaching that it happened? There's only one explanation, my friends. And I've not heard anyone ever ever give a satisfactory answer. Otherwise, it's the resurrection. Even the Apostle Paul, who himself was part of the elite religious establishment that killed Jesus, who himself hunted down and imprisoned and killed his followers, even Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was converted, would eventually die for refusing to shut up about the risen Christ. I think Saul was probably the one single strongest argument for the resurrection. And he would later write in 1 Corinthians 15, known as the resurrection chapter of the Bible, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Apparently that was going around at the Corinthian church. 
If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, you have no business being around a Christian community at all because it's just a waste of time. Except we have really good potlucks. More than that, Paul says, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. We're liars, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But, if he, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Paul staked his entire life, career, and ministry on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we are called to do the same. We are called as followers of Jesus to live as followers of the one who is alive, who defeated death. And that just should change everything about our lives. So Mark Moore, in his book, Core 52, he says, why should I believe Jesus rose from the dead? He, he offers four facts affirmed by virtually every historian of the, of the first century world. And, and if these are true, then only the resurrection of Jesus accounts for them. I just want to hit these really fast. And then go downstairs and eat turkey. Anyone with me? Yeah. Oh, all right. Let's just get to the turkey. Number one, Jesus was executed by crucifixion. This is historical fact. Some people like to deny this. Some people, you'll, again, my friend that, that became an atheist, he says the New Testament was written decades after the time of Jesus. But historically, the information we have about Jesus in the early church is like right next door. It's within dec decades in history is not a long period of time. When you consider that there's hundreds and thousands of years between even older manuscripts of things that aren't biblical at all. But it's historical fact. Jesus was executed by crucifixion. Josephus and Tacitus were first century historians within decades of this event were making reference to it. He was dead. The Romans were experts at cruelty. They were experts at killing people. They stuck a spear into his side and water and blood gushed out. And doctors will tell you that's a sign that the heart has stopped beating. The blood and the water have separated. They didn't even break his legs. They would break the legs of someone on a cross so that their body would sag and they would just drown and be suffocated. They didn't even have to do that to Jesus because he was dead. Secondly, the tomb was empty. We read in the account in Matthew that the Jewish leaders paid the guards to say the disciples stole the body. Jesus said, it's funny because Jesus' followers didn't pick up on the resurrection, but the leaders did. They heard him say that he was going to raise from the dead, and they were scared to death because they couldn't stand him. And he's popular now. What if word gets out that he's risen from the dead? He'll be unstoppable. And they were right. In this instance, the religious leaders had more faith than Jesus' own followers. So they go to the, the governing authorities and they say, we want to post a guard. We're scared to death that he's going to raise from the dead. And if something does happen, we'll just tell people that the disciples came and stole the body. That's exactly what happened. Jesus raises from the dead. They pay off the guards to say that the disciples stole the body. Where is the body of Jesus? Why didn't they just produce it? Because it's not there. So you're, you're talking about a resurrection and a bunch of guys who didn't even believe in the resurrection all of a sudden preaching the resurrection and dying for that preaching. Does it make sense that they would be lying? This is some huge, what did they stand to get from it? Every one of the early Christians for centuries stood to gain nothing by preaching Jesus. And yet they wouldn't shut up. Chuck Colson uh, was Richard Nixon's hatchet man back in the Nixon administration. He's the one that said he would run over his grandmother to get the president reelected. He was not a nice guy. Went to prison for his role in Watergate, became a follower of Jesus in prison, and then started Prison Fellowship, which is, still goes to this date. 
He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed the truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate, on the other hand, embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And he goes on in, in his books and in his interviews and in his speeches to talk about John Dean. Ratted him out to save his own skin. It's all about, you know how the cops do it? They separate you out. Good cop, bad cop. Someone's going to break. Someone's going to talk. John Dean ratted them all out. Three weeks. So why didn't they crack? Because they had come face to face with the living God. They could not deny what they had seen. The fact is people will give their lives for what they believe is true. They will never give their lives for what they know is a lie. And that's what's got to happen if you believe that the resurrection did not happen. The Watergate cover-up proves that 12 powerful men in modern America couldn't keep a lie and that 12 powerless men 2,000 years ago couldn't have been telling anything but the truth. So there's the death of Jesus. There's the empty tomb. Jesus appeared in a real physical body. Remember, these guys aren't expecting it. They're running and they're scared. Jesus had to convince them Several times in the Gospels. Read the end of all the Gospels. Jesus pleading with these guys to believe that he really, it really is him. D -d -d Doubting Thomas. John chapter 20. I don't believe, you guys are making it up. There's no way Jesus rose from the, I won't, I won't believe unless I put my finger right there where the nails went through. I touched the, the, the wound in his side. And then Jesus is like, hey Tom. Touch. Thomas would go on, history says, to die for preaching the risen Jesus in the country of India. Remember what he said when Jesus appeared to him? My Lord and my God. The same confession we make when we're baptized into Jesus because we believe, we accept the evidence. This is true, this is real. He is my Lord, he is my God. Oh, it was a hallucination. They were just hallucinating. <laughs> Psychiatrists will tell you that yes, it's possible that one or two of them had a hallucination, but the idea that over 500 of them, because Jesus appeared to over 500, to the idea that they all had the same hallucination is beyond credibility, it's impossible. It's like suggesting that two people have the same dream. No way. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, he appeared to over 500 witnesses. Many were still living when Paul wrote. In Acts 26, Paul is on trial in Jerusalem, and he's before King Agrippa, and he's explaining to him the resurrection from the dead, and he says to him, King Agrippa, this stuff wasn't done in a corner. I know you know about these things. Paul is appealing to what is now common knowledge in Jerusalem. Jesus is alive, and people have seen him and interacted with him. And look at the transformation of the apostles. Peter, who was running for his life and denying Jesus a few days later, is preaching the church into existence on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem before the very people that killed Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, went from a skeptic to a church leader in Jerusalem. Thomas, we mentioned, would die preaching in India. Saul of Tarsus would become the apostle. Paul would eventually die in Rome at the hands of Caesar. What else explains it? And then, of course, there's the existence of, of the church. Born just 50 days after Jesus has been executed in Jerusalem, everyone knew that he died. Everyone in Jerusalem had probably seen it. It was on a hill. They could just go anywhere and watch it. If they hadn't seen it, they heard about it. And all of a sudden, the church, in one afternoon, comes into existence, and over 3,000 people are baptized, and that number just kept increasing and increasing. In Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of David, 
Among the Jewish people, the day of worship changed. It went from Saturday, the Sabbath, and all of a sudden believers are gathering on Sunday, the first day of the week. Why? Because on the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead. How did that happen? What we just took here today, celebration of the Lord's Supper all around the world. It's been going on for 2,000 years. We remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the practice of baptism by immersion, the acting out. You're baptized into Jesus, you're baptized into his death, you're buried with him, and then it figures your resurrection with him. Romans chapter 6, among the Jewish people becoming followers of Jesus, circumcision is no more. If you know anything about Bible history, circumcision was the holy grail. You didn't touch it. Matter of fact, it was a huge issue in the early church coming to that decision, but to do away with circumcision. And the church went on to change history. The history of the world is the history of the church, especially the modern world. Then and now facing opposition and persecution, and the church has been and was and is and will be a worldwide force for good. We are known for benevolence and compassion. Unlike any other religious group, every city's got a Saint Somebody hospital. All over the world on the mission field are followers of Jesus Christ sacrificing themselves. Because of the example of their Savior, doing good, literacy programs, jobs programs, healing. I have friends right now in Port-au-Prince who could leave if they wanted to. But they stay, risking their lives. Even as we speak, there are 16 or 17 missionaries holed up somewhere in Port-au-Prince, held captive. They knew full well when they went down there what they would face. Why do people do that? Shouldn't we play it safe? Isn't life about playing it safe? Isn't life about just live comfortably and then slide safely into death? Painlessly. We never got that from Jesus. Well, so what? (laughs) I like that little kid. I just thought he's kind of cute. Yeah, big deal. (laughs) What? What do you want me to do with this? Why does this matter, Jim? Mark Moore says everything matters. Death is defeated. Jesus is exalted at the right hand of God. He's an advocate for his people. He has all the power. Stephen Mathewson wrote a book called 50 Reasons Why the Resurrection Changes Everything. I'm just going to take a few moments and work through all 50. No, just get the book. It's, It's endless. Why does it matter? 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ isn't resurrected, then it's all in vain. It's empty. It's useless. He goes on to say, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So what? So what? Hope is so what? And that's what the world is desperate for. Hope. Tim Keller says hope is used two ways. There's hope in humans and there's hope in God. When you hope in humans, it's always relative. It's always uncertain. I hope they pay me back. You ever loan money to somebody? Hope he pays me back. Well, good luck with that. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Or you make an investment. I hope it pays off. Hope in humans is always uncertain, but the outcome is never 100% controllable. But because of the resurrection, when you hope in God, your hope is full of confidence. Your hope is full of assurance. Your hope is full of assurity. Hebrews 11, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. My friends, God is trustworthy. His plan is infinitely wise and good. The resurrection of Jesus confirms a God who is both good and powerful, a God who brings light from darkness who patiently works out his plan for his glory, our good, and for the good of the world. We serve a God who brings joy out of sorrow. What would I say to Margie's friend Bill as he wandered around wondering what was happening in the foyer at the Buxmont Christian Church? I would say, Bill, I can be happy in the face of tragedy and loss of someone that I love because of this hope. 
Jesus Christ is alive and that makes all the difference. And my prayer is that it would make all the difference for you too. I hope that you're sitting here and I am a follower of Jesus and I believe and my life is built upon this single truth. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. If you question that, if you doubt that, if you're iffy on that, we need to talk. We need to get that straightened out because that is the source of your hope. A historical event. So it makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world is built on some ism, some teaching, something out there. Something metaphysical, something beyond the tangible. But our Christian hope is built on an event, and we can go right back in history and time and look at it through the eyewitness testimony of those who were there. And the only question is, are you going to believe it? And for those of us who believe, we can stare death and hardship and pain and tragedy, we can stare it right in the face and say, you are not going to win. You have already been defeated. And one day, one day, this risen Lord is going to return. And everybody will believe. I choose to believe now. I hope you do too.